I'm Nancy White, the program chair of the Arlington Historical Society. The Society would like to remind you that we have many wonderful holiday gift ideas for sale at the table at the back of the auditorium, including Arlington note cards, several books, and 200th anniversary memorabilia. Richard Duffy's most recent book, Then and Now, Arlington, is also available, and it would certainly make a very special gift. If you would like Richard to inscribe your gift, he will be at the table after the lecture. All sales proceeds from this title go to the Historical Society this evening, and the author's royalties support the local history room at Robbins Library. Tonight we have a most appropriate speaker to deliver the opening remarks for Dennis Ahern's lecture on the influenza epidemic of 1918. I am delighted to introduce Christine Connolly, who is the Town of Arlington's Director of Health and Human Services. Prior to assuming her larger role this past summer, encompassing the wide array of human services delivered by the town, Christine had served for several years as the town's Director of Public Health. We will hear highlights of the history of the Health Department and learn from Christine how its function has changed over the years to continue to affect our daily lives here in Arlington. Please welcome, with a warm welcome, Christine Connolly. Thank you. In 1799, the first Board of Health in the country was formed in Boston and was chaired by Paul Revere. Boards of Health have long served as the sole agency within a community charged with protecting the health of the public above all other interests. Here in Arlington, lower, okay, slower, okay, okay. Here in Arlington, the Board of Selectmen served as our original Board of Health. In 1872, the town annual report, the Board of Selectmen reported that they built a quarantine hospital in the Mount Pleasant Cemetery, where they housed smallpox patients during a smallpox outbreak. By the late 1890s, due to the increasing health demands on the town, the town needed a separate Board of Health. In its early stages as a separate board, the Arlington Board of Health dealt with issues ranging from contagious diseases such as diphtheria and smallpox to issues related to slaughterhouses and cesspools. In 1900, tuberculosis, also known as TB, was the primary cause of death in Arlington. Once it was known that TB was a contagious disease spread person to person, public health measure measures such as quarantine were put into place to prevent the spread of this deadly disease. Today in Arlington, there are still TB cases which are followed closely by the public health nurse. Rather than strict quarantining of TB cases, the public health nurse is required to directly observe the patient taking the antibiotics. In 1905, the Board of Health was hard at work investigating a malaria epidemic in the swamps of the Alewife in East Arlington. As you know, malaria is spread by mosquitoes. And in the past five years here in Massachusetts, we have seen a rise in mosquito-borne diseases such as West Nile virus and Eastern equine encephalitis. In 1918, there are 2,700 cases of contagious diseases reported to the Board of Health for follow-up. Today, over 100 years later, the public health nurse still receives these contagious disease reports. Current state law requires doctors to report all ca cases of contagious disease to the local Board of Health for follow-up by the public health nurse. In 2005, there were only 125 cases of these diseases. These numbers have dropped drastically over the years, and these were due to medical discoveries and public health initiatives, such as immunization campaigns and antibiotics. Many of you may remember public vaccination campaigns, such as the Be Wise, Immunize campaign of the 1950s, where the polio vaccine was administered to the public in large public buildings. In fact, the Be Wise, Immunize campaign made its way here to Arlington and offered the vaccine right here in this very auditorium that we are seated in this evening. In the mid-1990s, the department became among the first in the nation to establish local tobacco control regulations banning smoking in the workplace. 
And today, we have a whole host of new and emerging public health issues that we deal with each day. Today in Arlington, there are over 160 permitted food establishments in the town that we inspect up to four times per year to ensure safe food for the public. The department also enforces the housing code to ensure safety in rental units in the town, as well as a number of other environmental health and safety codes. <clears throat> as we look ahead, the department will continue the long-standing tradition of honoring the mission of the Board of Health to protect the health of the public of the town of Arlington. Now, I am pleased to introduce our principal speaker of the evening, Mr. Dennis J. Ahern. An Arlington native, Dennis is among many generations of Aherns to have called Arlington home. He often combines his love of and expertise in Irish genealogy with his interest in Arlington history and has spoken to varied audiences on these topics, both singly and in combination. Some of Dennis's talks that have been presented locally include The Advocate's Devil, selected readings from the early issues of the Arlington Advocate, Up from Goat Acre, the, Mrs., the unsinkable Mrs. Brown of Titanic fame, and Not All Carved in Stone, a look at West Cambridge's contributions to the Civil War. Dennis served as the Arlington Historical Society for three years as vice president of the program, which included chairing the program com committee for the town of Arlington's Millennium Lecture Series in the 1999 to 2000 season. We are happy to welcome him back to the Town Hall Auditorium, this time to take the stage to present A Plague in Arlington, coping with the influenza epidemic of 1918. I'm also going to have to use this mic. One is for the cable TV, and the other is for the rest of you. Um, I saw something in the Boston Globe just the other day about Ken Burns. He's going to do a documentary, or he's doing a documentary on World War II. And what motivated him was the discovery that some of the younger generation are under the impression that Germany was our ally in World War II. <laughs> well, I don't see anybody of that generation in the audience, but if you get a chance, I, I would urge you to encourage young people to learn more about history, both their local history and their natural, national history. Otherwise, we are doomed to repeat it. Um, who knows what we might end up repeating in the way of an influenza epidemic. We've been worrying recent years about SARS and various avian flus and so forth. So it'll be interesting to see what happened with the influenza pandemic of 1918. Uh, it's really amazing that it's been so completely erased from our collective memory. Um, I know in my own family, I, I once asked my Aunt Fran if she had ever had a bow of any sort, and she said there had been a young man that was sort of courting her, and he went home to Nova Scotia on a visit around the time of the influenza epidemic, and she never heard of him again, and she wonders if he passed away. But uh, so she died an old maid, as it were, um, and there are many others who were left widowed and fatherless from the influenza epidemic of 1918. Now, there had always been various forms of flu, um, but in March, uh, next slide, please. Um, do we have these uh, lights? Oh, good, thank you. Um, in March of 1918, there was a, an outbreak that began on the 4th of March at Camp Funston, which was an army camp at Fort Riley, Kansas. And uh, some of the local papers uh, did not think it was too serious. This was partly uh, due to the, the nature of this particular outbreak, um, but it was also partly to do with wartime censorship. You'll find that the newspapers didn't want to report anything serious uh, being wrong with anything to do with the military because it could hurt the war effort. So the, the number of deaths was somewhat downplayed. But in that one month of March at Camp Funston, there were 233 cases and 48 died, uh, which actually is 
is rather mild compared to what was to come later. Um, next slide, please. The patients that develop the symptoms, um, as, as you can see, the uh, base hospital, the emergency hospital is made up of the gymnasium and they were just in there cheek by jowl. Next, please. Um, the doctors at first were really worried that this might actually be something called the Black Death because the victims that came down with it, and it was rather sudden, uh, their faces turned very dark purple. And uh, this was reminiscent of the symptoms of the Black Death. Uh, they were not able to examine the influenza virus under the microscopes of that day. It wasn't until they invented electron microscopes that we were able to get the image you see here. But the, the uh, lung tissue was just turned into a, a mass of sodden pulp. Uh, and the reason the faces turned purple is they were so starved for oxygen, their body was taking the oxygen right out of their face, out of the skin of their face. Next, please. Now, uh, they tried various vaccines and uh, they tried antiseptic sprays. Oh, I'm sorry, I should have alerted you. This is a PG presentation here. <laughs> some, some nudity. It wasn't mentioned in the previews. Uh, next, please. Now, all these men were shipped off to France to fight in the trenches, but a lot of them died before they got there. Uh, they were packed into troop ships in very close quarters, and some of the men from Camp Funston uh, managed to spread the disease on board the ship. This particular ship, the USS Grant, uh, arriving at the major debarkation port of Brest in France, uh, you see the coffins on the deck where 137 men died on that trip alone. Next, please. Uh, back home, there were soldiers returning on ships. Um, and in this case, there was a, uh, the Boston Globe had uh, free tickets for a, a bunch of wounded veterans who had returned from France. And they went to see uh, Babe Ruth and the Red Sox win the World Series against the Chicago Cubs. It says, see the Red Sox mall, the Bruins, and you can picture the baseball bats and the hockey sticks, but they were not the Bruins that you're thinking of. The Bruins was the nickname for the Chicago Cubs who lost. But of course, we also lost in that we lost Babe Ruth. Next. Uh, one of the <clears throat> largest camps, or the largest camp in Massachusetts, was Camp Devons out in Ayer, Massachusetts. And at that time, there were 50,000 men at Camp Devons in September of 1918. And by September 23rd, 10,700 of them had the flu. And Camp Devons was to be the hardest hit of all US Army posts. Next. Now, it's said, although I don't have statistics to compare it, um, it's said that Arlington was one of the hardest hit towns in the Boston area. Now, <clears throat> maybe it had something to do with the fact that there were a lot of Arlington men uh, going through training at Camp Devons and the very patriotic citizens and thoughtful citizens and parents of Arlington had arranged various methods of transportation of going out and bringing the boys home for a Sunday dinner or bringing them home for the weekend so they could go into Boston on, on a weekend pass or something. Uh, so there was a lot of traffic back and forth between Arlington and Devons. Next, please. The other connection, uh, I call him the canary in the mine shaft of this event, uh, was at the, um, what was called the receiving ship Boston. It wasn't actually a ship. It was in the Commonwealth Pier, which you may recognize from this picture as being now the World Trade Center. It's not very much changed. But um, Seaman Second Class Charles Nolan O'Donnell died of disease 8 September 1918 at the receiving ship Boston. Now this is based on information in the record of World War I dead from Arlington. And I thought, aha, this is what explains how 
Allington became so infected, um, this semen O'Donnell. Well, it turns out not to be the case because when I examined his death certificate, I discovered that the disease he died of was peritonitis. And he had gotten this <clears throat> from injuries received in an automobile accident several days before in Lexington. Now, however, the honor guard for his funeral included many sailors from the receiving ship Boston, which is where on the 3rd of September, uh, they started having cases of influenza. So if you draw a line between uh, the Commonwealth Pier in Boston and Camp Devons and Air, it probably would go right through Arlington. Well, at least the influenza proceeded to go right through Arlington. Next. Um, because of the <coughs> censorship, uh, most people referred to this as the Spanish flu. The reason for that is that in May, of 1918, in that one month, eight million people were sick with influenza in Spain. Even the Spanish king was not immune and had come down with influenza. Now again, we come back to the wartime censorship. Uh, they didn't uh, report outbreaks in England or in the trenches in France, but it's thought that the influenza virus that was brought over from Camp Funston may have mutated somehow in Brest. Now, one of the things they had in Brest was a large piggery to supply pork for the troops. Now, there's some speculation recently that this uh, might have been a crossbreeding. Just as they have the bird flu uh, mutates various viruses and makes bird to human contact, they think that the piggeries might have somehow gotten the flu from incoming boatloads of soldiers, and then it somehow mutated and became a much more virulent strain. But it soon began to spread through the trenches, and in some regiments, as many as 80% of the men were, were out of action for one reason or another with the flu, either coming down with it or recovering from it. Next. Now, in Arlington, we started to have the first deaths. Now, you'll notice Oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over one. Um, the important thing seemed to be not that people were going to die from this, but that it menaced our war production. Again, they called it the Spanish flu, and they were more concerned about its impact on the war than anything else. Next, please. Uh, this shows the spread of it in the United States. Uh, up until the first half of September, it was pretty much isolated to around Boston and down to like Fall River and around there. There's no place else in the country that had really had any outbreak yet. Next. And in Boston, it started off, the first one was on September 2nd, but you'll notice the cause it says pulmonary tuberculosis. Now, as I go through these various pages that show, and these are records from the town clerk's office, you'll see sometimes it mentions influenza, sometimes just pneumonia. Um, but if you go and look at the uh, reports of these deaths in the advocate, you'll find it, it might say pneumonia resulting from influenza. And in fact, a lot of the doctors were just writing in pneumonia because it was a form of pneumonia as far as they were concerned that was the final cause of death. Uh, now, the individuals, uh, one of them is uh, James D. King. It says he's a piano framer. His uh, World War I draft record states that he's employed by Theodore Schwamm as a piano framer. And this was not at the, the Schwamm mill that we think of today, but um, it was another Schwamm mill that was owned by uh, uh, the brother of Charles Schwamm. Charles Schwamm had what we now know as the old Schwamm mill, and his brother Theodore had another mill off of Mass Ave where he made piano frames. Uh, Gately is another one, John E. Gately of Mystic Street. Uh, his parents were Irish immigrants. Um, you might see familiar names on here from families you recognize. 
Or you might also take note of addresses and you say, gee, that was right in my neighborhood. Uh, Nickerson, Wallace F. Nickerson, uh, he was an engraver, he printed greeting cards and he had just opened a, a shop for that business on Federal Street in Boston. Uh, Tobin, Thomas James Tobin, uh, he was single, he was from County Cork in Ireland. And Georgie McNamara, Georgie McNamara used to be a chauffeur for Judge Brackett, but he got himself a wartime job as an aviation foreman. Uh, he died, he left a widow and two children. Next. Speaking of the Schwann Mill, here's a notice that was found recently uh, on the wall there. It's in the Lenswood Bulletin and it says, uh, well, keep clean, wash your hands before, don't go to crowded places, etc., etc., etc. Like, don't go to see Babe Ruth. Um, next, please. They closed the uh, schools. The Board of Health decided to close the schools. The head of the, the chairman of the Board of Health at that time was Alfred Knowles. And Alfred Knowles was no stranger to crisis because he was a veteran of the Civil War and had actually been a captain in the famous 54th Massachusetts Regiment, which was largely wiped out at uh, Battery Wagner. You might have seen the movie Glory. But uh, Knowles was the uh, quartermaster for the unit through the end of the war. And there was a funny thing happened, well, I'm digressing, but some years after the war, he got a letter from the federal government to the effect that the accounts that he was responsible for had not quite balanced, and they were sending him a check for $20, and he was saying, I'm glad it wasn't the other way around. But when they closed the school, um, Miss Dunham at the Russell School told the children to collect peach stones because they were still using them for uh, gas mask canisters. And when the schools were reopened, the children turned in 10,000 peach stones. And where do you get 10,000 peach stones in, in Arlington, even in 1918? Next. One of the children who was no longer able to go to school wrote a postcard to a friend in Maine and she said, how is school? I haven't any now. And she's talking about how awful the sickness is and the fact that the, the hospital is taking care of people. Now, this was addressed to Miss Lulu Douglas in West Baldwin, Maine. And it was dated September 28th. And it's written by Esther H. Reed. She was 15 years old. She lived on Newman Way off of Massachusetts Avenue and she had two older sisters. Uh, their father was a commercial traveler in the furniture trade. Next. This is the other side of the postcard. It shows the backside or the side porches of Sims Hospital, at the building that at the time was Sims Hospital. Next. And here's the, the front of the same building. Uh, in one month, they had 38 cases uh, of influenza, 37 of pneumonia, and they only had eight deaths. Next. Now, it seemed uh, as early as uh, 21 September that uh, things were getting better and uh, the deaths were tapering off. The radio school that they're referring to here was at Harvard, and they had uh, temporary barracks had been built on Cambridge Common for the students of the radio school. Next. So you see it's starting to spread down the East Coast and around up into Maine and then various patches like Chicago and Los Angeles and a couple of places in Texas and so forth. So you see it's starting to spread. Next. The Board of Health also asked that the churches uh, suspend their religious services. Uh, this caused a problem for the Catholic churches St. Agnes and St. James, uh, because if you didn't go to Mass and you died, well, you might go to hell because you hadn't you know, been able to go to confession. This, this influenza happened so fast that if you got it, you could get up in the morning and feel fine and you'd be dead before night. So you had to choose, do I, do I go to Mass and risk exposing myself to other people who might have it? 
Lord, or I risk dying not in a state of grace. So, so the Catholic churches um, kept services, but they kept them to a minimum. Next. In some communities, the churches assembled outdoors. Now, I don't think that really protected them any because they were still assembling and they were in close proximity. These masks that everybody wore, by the way, were totally ineffective. They didn't realize it, but they were pretty much ineffective. Next. Uh, this shows another picture of a hospital. He's not wearing a mask, I wonder why. Next. Again, it's starting to spread now more onto the west coast and further inland on the Atlantic coast. Next. And here's 12 deaths in just five days, so things are definitely heating up. Uh, Mary McKenna, she was a cousin of our Hearns, and she lived catty corner across the street on the corner of Webster and Warren, and she died at Sims Hospital. Uh, her 11-month-old daughter, Eleanor, died at home three days later. Now, Nelson, John Alfred Nelson, he was a Swedish immigrant. He was not a citizen, he was an alien. And he was partner in a leather firm in Boston. And he left a widow by the name of Magda. Uh, John Walter Sheridan, he was a single man. He had been born in Winchester. Now, the Femias, Joseph Femia, North Union Street, um, he had been born in a place in Italy called Gratteria Reggio, and he came with his mother in 1900 at the age of seven. His father had come several years earlier to establish himself before sending to the family. And uh, young Joseph worked on his father's farm. Now, one of the characters, William J. Doan, was a photographer, next. And here is actually a picture of William, William James Oliver Doan. And the advocate reported that he had been a, uh, started his own business of photography. And he was taken ill with the grip, which was another name for influenza from Nova Scotia. Next. Here's a picture, a self-portrait of William Doan taken at Spy Pond. Looks like it might be on Elizabeth Island, possibly. Next. Um, I couldn't find the citation of To Save My Life, but I swear I read in The Advocate an item that reported witnesses having seen a German U-boat surface in Boston Harbor and disperse an aerosol spray of influenza germs. These were witnesses' statements. Well, I haven't been able to find that article, but I did find this other mention in the Globe that suggests that the Germans were sending men ashore off of submarines to open up vials of influenza in movie theaters and other such places, which is probably why the movie theaters were closed. But I can't help but wonder if the Colonel Doan, D-O-A-N-E, is any relation to the Mr. Doan who passed away in Arlington. Next. Um, Harvey Lowe, he worked at the Bay State Laundry in Cambridge. He was actually born in Cambridge. Uh, Grace McClellan, she was a nurse at F Camp Devons. We call it Fort Devons now, but it was called Camp, Camp Devons then. She was from Lyman Street. Uh, now Mulgrew, James Edward Mulgrew, uh, he was the treasurer and manager of Rawson Products Company and he left a widow and three children. Now, as Beatrice Weatherby was 12 years old. She died in Chester, New Hampshire, but her death was recorded in the Arlington Town Clerk. Uh, she is the same age as my father, so I can't help but wonder if he might have known her. Next. Here are some nurses who died in the influenza. Uh, I mentioned earlier Grace Elizabeth McClellan who was at Camp Devons when she died. Uh, she was one of five nurses who died at Devons, along with two doctors. 
they were working 18 to 20 hours a day. At one point, there were 400 nurses caring for soldiers at Devons. Next. Two of the other nurses who died were uh, Arlington in that they were, one of them was from Arlington, but they both had graduated from the Arlington uh, Nursing Training School, and uh, one had died in uh, Marlboro, or oh, she went to the Wellesley Emergency Hospital to work, but she was from Marlboro, and she died there. And the other, Miss Carey, was from Southbridge, Mass., and she was working on duty at uh, Gallops Island in Boston Harbor. Um, I think Gallops Island had originally been uh, used as an immigrant um, uh, quarantine station, and they had to shift it over to use as a uh, special hospital. Uh, next, please. Uh, here are the names of some other nurses of Arlington. Um, Elizabeth Burns, for one, she was scheduled to go overseas, but the war ended before she she did. In the meantime, she was caring for influenza patients at the MIT Aviation Dispensary. Not shown on here is a Mrs. Peck, whose first name we don't know. She was a district nurse, uh, which I'm not sure whether it was supplied by the county or the state, but she was the district nurse. And the advocate reported at one point that she made 45 visits in 24 consecutive hours. Next. The uh, Arlington doctors were also kept hopping. Um, the numbers next to each name are the deaths attributed to that doctor. And you might think that means Dr. Buckley was a very bad doctor, but no, it really means he made a lot of house calls. And in fact, uh, he came down with the influenza himself and was out of action for a couple of weeks, so it's remarkable he treated as many people as he did. Uh, Dr. Buckley was uh, 36 at the time. His parents were Irish immigrants. And his son Daniel was then three. His son Daniel went on to become a lawyer. In fact, our family used him as an attorney, and I can remember him. He had one droopy eyelid, if any of you remember him. He had one eyelid that, that stayed closed. Uh, Dr. Meikle was 46, born in Canada, lived on Park Ave, and he was no relation to Bill Meikle uh, of Ben Franklin fame. Dr. Percy was 49 from Maine. He lived on Water Street. Dr. Zatwood and Talty were both born in Rhode Island. And Dr. Webb was 38, born in Maine, lived on Pleasant Street. Next. Again, they were very concerned with uh, preventing the spread of the influenza through coughing and sneezing. That's why they all had these masks. Next. And if you didn't have a mask, the conductor wouldn't even let you get on the trolley. Uh, next. Now, here's a map, speaking of trolleys, of the distribution uh, of influenza deaths. And this is just a rough draft uh, map. And if you'll notice, a lot of them are clustered along the trolley lines. Uh, in fact, I think it's something like 67% of the deaths in Arlington were within one block of the trolley line. Next. The police were doing duty as ambulance drivers. Uh, you can go over to the Arlington uh, uh, police office, police department, and they have an archive. You can sit there and read the logbooks. And here's just some notes from a logbook for just one day. You can see that they were running patients to Sims Hospital and to the temporary hospital and uh, various other places. Oh, Daly's. Let's remember that. Call for an ambulance by Dr. Talty to take a patient from Daly's. Uh, it's also spelled D-A-L-E-Y-S. Yes, <laughs> she's in the front row. Um, next. So, as you can see, towards the end of September, beginning of October, it's spreading throughout the country. Pacific Northwest, so far, is not impacted too much. You can tell the places that have more rural areas seem to have not been hit so much yet. 
uh, it tended to spread along the railway lines. Next. The uh, Boy Scouts were pressed into service to uh, help deliver groceries and uh, deliver circulars. The mailman still made his rounds. Next. Uh, up to this point, beginning of October, there had been 1,273 cases and 30 deaths so far. And one doctor, I don't know whether this was Dr. Buckley, made 56 calls in one day. That's 56, 56, that's uh, two an hour for a 24 hour period if you don't go to sleep at all. And the emergency hospital they opened on Court Street where the post office is now and uh, St. Agnes Church sent five nuns to act as nurses. And you can't help but uh, wonder if that was uh, in payment for being allowed to stay open for masses. Uh, Walter Hutchinson loaned his Ford car to use as an ambulance and the State Guard, which was a local volunteer group, provided stretcher bearers. Next. The uh, State Guard, as I say, was Arlington Volunteers. Uh, McCaffrey, Simpson, Durrell, Hersey, Watson, Alexander, Gillis, Barrett, Puffer, Miller, Swan, Sweeney, Warren, and Wilson were the men who served in this unit. Next. Uh, many communities sent up, set up tent hospitals, temporary hospitals, outdoors. It was thought that the fresh air would be good for people. Next. And in fact, uh, from Arlington, you could see the hospital on Quarry Hill in Dorchester. I don't know if you could see Quarry Hill in Dorchester now if you stood at the intersection of Pleasant Street and Mass Ave. Probably not, but things were lower to the ground back then. Next. Here's another tent hospital that was set up in Lawrence. Next. And here's the emergency hospital that was set up in Arlington at number 10 Court Street. It was then being used as a border trade building but it had been the home of the Bryant family. And it was, they treated 30 patients with no deaths. The nuns were acting as nurses. The gas company provided stoves and kitchen utensils were borrowed from the high school. And this is where the post office stands now. Next. Uh, here's another picture of uh, Corey Hill. And here you see two nuns of the Sisters of St. Joseph Remember those habits, any of you who went to St. Agnes parochial school will recognize that. And there are some other nuns of different orders in this picture as well. Next. This was back before the internet and computers. We had telephones and typewriters. And I can remember when I was a, a kid on the way home from school, I used to stop at the gas company where my father worked and the woman on the switchboard would let me sit there and plug in the cords when the little lights came on to show where the, where the telephone calls were to be directed, and I thought that was the greatest thing. Next. Uh, here's 10 deaths in three days, just over the end of September, beginning of October. Now, Mrs. Salt, Coralie Salt, she was born in Tennessee. She had two sons serving in France. And Eugene Legender was a barber. Uh, most of the barber shops in town were closed because many of the barbers were sick. Uh, in those days, men used to go to the barber shop to get shaved at least once a week. So on top of everything else to deal with the flu, the men were probably all growing beards for the duration. Uh, Frank Malone on Beacon Street, he was a teamster. He drove a, an ice wagon. His widow, Margaret, was Irish born, 37 years old, and he left her with six children ages one to 13. Next. Now, here is the records of some servicemen who died uh, overseas or stateside. Uh, Private Grady, was actually from next door to the Aherns on the corner of Warren Street and uh, Webster Street. And these two down the bottom, George Miller and Arthur H. Vale, 
uh, were the same age, and they had lived at 66 and 38 Walnut Street, respectively. And they died on the same day in France. In the case of Arthur, it says Langres, France, but it isn't that specific for George. But they died on the very same day. They were both in the 101st ammunition train, and they had grown up next to each other on Walnut Street. Next. Here's the beginning of October, just four days. Uh, these are not consistent. I couldn't do one for every week because sometimes I had more than a page full for a week, so I, I kind of had to ration them out. Uh, now, Rose Rogers, Rose McNamara, um, she was uh, George McNamara's brother, and uh, he had uh, also been sick with the flu. And William Charles Daly, at one Park Street place, he was a farmer, and he was 18 when he died. Next. Uh, this is the uh, Dr. Deans Hospital on Appleton Street. Uh, this was where uh, Mary J. Carroll had died. Next. So by now it's pretty much covered the entire country, some places heavier than others. Next. And here's October 6th to 12th, one week, 11 deaths. Now this Catherine Ryan, her maiden name was Daly, and if you recognize this one Park Street place, that's her brother that died at one Park Street place the week before, or actually only about three days before. And she was married. She had been living in Somerville uh, after she married, but her husband, having gone overseas to France in the army, she took her two little children and came back to live at the family homestead at one Park Street place. Next. So what is an epidemic and what's a pandemic? Basically, a pandemic is a whopping big epidemic. It's over a wide geographic area. And amazingly, the influenza of 1918 managed to spread to pretty much all corners of the globe. And it was probably partly due to the, the war and troops going back and forth from different countries. I mean, troops from Australia were going to Europe and back. And so it, it managed to spread throughout the world. But think how fast it would spread now with airplane traffic. It would out break out so rapidly. I, I, I hope our public health people are on top of that. Next. Here's 12 deaths in one week. Uh, one of them that's interesting is uh, Charles F. Donahue. That says he's a janitor. He was actually called the superintendent. And he was the superintendent of this building and I'm sure his ghost is probably haunting this room that he swept the floor of so many, 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 many times. Um, he was also the uh, sealer of weights and measures, and he left a widow by the name of Rosetta, uh, and she went to board with the Davis family on Mass Ave after he died. Now, Giuseppe Rea, the shoemaker. Uh, he and his wife Teresa were both immigrants from Italy. Next. Some of you may have heard of this jump rope rhyme. I had a little bird and its name was Enza. I opened the window and in flew Enza. They actually had an order issued at Camp Devons ordering soldiers not to be repeating this rhyme. What they were getting pleasure out of it, I don't know, but they were. Next. I don't have anything on, on this one. Here's Joseph Darling, who died at Mare Island, California. Uh, some of these You'll see, for example, Oscar Woodruff was from New York, but he died at the Ring Sanatorium here in Arlington. And 
here, this Minnie Wachowicz, she was from Arlington, but she died at Westboro State. Now, some of these may in fact be tuberculosis and not influenza. But I've, I've gone ahead and I've collected all the ones that were pneumonia, influenza, or pulmonary TB because sometimes the, uh, the, the, uh, the causes overlapped. Next. The only one in this picture that's likely to be a victim is the, the father. It did not tend to strike at children or the elderly. Next. Here's nine deaths in five weeks. So now it's starting to spread out. There's hardly anything going on here in November. Um, the only one of note is uh, Mildred Blagden, and she was one of the nurses who died, and she was a nurse at the Boston, or the Massachusetts Homeopathic Hospital in Boston. Next. And that hospital later merged with Boston University Medical Center, and that's what it is now. I have no idea what if any of those buildings may still be standing. Next. 14 deaths in two weeks, so that's about one a day. Um, Gilbert, Walter Gilbert, he was born in Lindenville, Vermont. He left a widow and four children under seven. Next. The Board of Health made sure the streets were kept clean. Next. 10 deaths in 10 days, still one a day average. December was, for some reason, November had very few deaths, but December they picked up again. The weather might have had something to do with it. Uh, Arthur Warner, you know, um, no, Samuel Warner. Samuel Warner's widow, uh, her name was Annabelle, and she came over from Ireland in 1899 and uh, married Samuel in 1905, and she was left a widow with six children ages one to 11. Uh, they, her brother-in-law, Fred, boarded with them uh, after Samuel died and uh, drove a milk wagon. Next. Now there's uh, one mistake on this. Uh, that should be Thomas, initial M, Thomas M. Hunt, not Thomas M. And uh, Mr. Clint, Fred Warren Clint, bank clerk, he was born in Maine. Next. Dr. Young's Hospital uh, was where the Pine Grove stands now in front of the Jason Russell House. Next. Uh, John J. O'Brien, it says his occupation was forester, which may have been a uh, protected choice A occupation um, because of the war he would otherwise probably expected to have been in the army because he had already served three years as a private in the army in the artillery. So I, I suspect his occupation had something to do with the fact that he was not again under arms. And Mr. Brock, Howard Folsom Brock, it says editor, he was the editor of the Boston Traveler newspaper. Next. Now here is a chart that shows the mortality in different cities across the U.S. and the percentage. Just looking at uh, the first 10 weeks, Philadelphia was the hardest hit with 0.69 of the population succumbing to the influenza. Next after that with 0.59 is Fall River. I don't know why Fall River got struck so hard. Pittsburgh and Baltimore, Syracuse, Nashville, and then Boston had 0.50, half of 1%. Half of 1% of the population of Boston died of influenza. And you can see it goes down the list, Lowell, San Francisco, Cambridge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Chicago. New York only had uh, 0.30, percent. Why should New York have so much, you know, half, half of what Philadelphia had? Was the sanitation better? What were the circumstances? I don't know. Next. And you can see some of these more Omaha, Louisville, St. Paul. Portland is probably Portland, Oregon. 
and St. Louis, Spokane, and Grand Rapids with 0.04%. Next. There were 138 deaths in Arlington. The 1915 population was 14,860, so that works out to 0.92%. So that's a pretty high percentage. And of these deaths, 63.7% were within one block of a trolley line. There were over 600,000 dead in the U.S., which if that happened today would be the equivalent of 1.4 million people. And more Americans died of the influenza than in all the wars of the 20th century. And more Americans died of the influenza of 1918 than died of all causes in France during the war. And more people died worldwide than from the Black Death in Europe in the 14th century. Next. Here's the age distribution in Arlington. As I said earlier, it tended to strike healthy people in their 20s and 30s. Starting out in September, you'll see it's mostly uh, 20s and 30s, with some children and teenagers, and then the progression is maintained as being the age of 20 to 40 being the greatest numbers. Next. I'd just like to thank everybody who helped prepare this talk, preparing slides and finding material for me and, and sharing their information and pictures. Uh, I'd also like to thank my wife, Lero, who mounted the map and the lists, which are over here, which I invite you to examine uh, after we're done with the slideshow. Uh, there are two lists. One is alphabetical, the other is chronological. And the dots on the map are all in color. So you can see uh, September was orange, October was red, November was black, December was green, and January is a light blue. And you'll see there's a key across the top that tells you that. But it's amazing if you look at the clustering down in East Arlington, uh, just off Mass Ave near the Yellow White Brook. The dots are so close together, they're, they're literally pasted on top of each other, and it's just one massive color. So uh, I think you'll find that interesting. And as I said, you, you may find names of families that you recognize, or you may find addresses that you recognize. So I invite you to, to take a look at that afterwards. Thank you. We, we come now to the dreaded question and answer, <laughs> which is where I show how little I really know. Does anybody have any comments or questions they'd like to uh, bring up? Yes. Did it only last one flu season? No, it just, it just lasted that one period. It was pretty much dissipated by the end of 1918 or early 1919. It, it went away and hasn't been back in that form since. Yes? Were the schools closed for months? Uh, the schools were closed for several weeks. I forget the exact dates. Uh, like I say, it must have taken them a while to come up with 10,000 peach pits. How many peach pits can Arlington's eat in a week? That, that'll tell you how, how long they were closed. Yes? Why was the age distribution the way it was? Well, I'm not a physician. Um, I have a suspicion. Because this particular strain found its first uh, opportunity amongst uh, large bodies of healthy young males thrown into close proximity, I think it sought out similar hosts once it broke loose. That's just a an assumption on my part. As I say, I have no medical background, so uh, I don't know whether I'm onto something or not. Yes? What was the gender ratio? The gender ratio, it, it tended more towards males. Uh, I didn't put a gender distribution up, but it, it tended somewhat more towards males. As I say, the shocking thing about this was that it was healthy young men. Um, one man, I, I skipped over him, uh, uh, 
he had just gotten his draft notice that morning and he was dead that night. I guess that was one way of not going to war. Yes. Yes. I, uh, the question was, there were two doctor rings that were one male and one female, and were they the proprietors of the ring sanatorium? And uh, Richard is nodding his head, yes. Um, I, I took that list of physicians from the 1918 town directory. So there were probably some names on there uh, of physicians who did not practice in Arlington, which is why their names did not show up on the uh, town clerk's records or certificates of death. There were some names, however, that I uh, did not have on that list, and they were uh, physicians who were practicing at uh, Sims Hospital um, and may not have actually otherwise been resident of Arlington. So I didn't have them on the list, and the list was getting somewhat long, so I left them off. Yes. Uh, the question was, there were so many people that died, quote, at home, and was that because there was no room in the hospital or because they took sick so fast? Well, you have to remember that in those days, people often did die at home. Uh, it wasn't uh, someplace you went off to the hospital as soon as you thought you were going to die. Um, it did come on them very suddenly, but yes, doctors made house calls and people sometimes died amongst their family. Death was not as much of a stranger to the household as it is today. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> and so it begins. Yes. I I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? How did the cemeteries what? How did the cemeteries cope? Well, actually, I don't have a lot of information on specifically the situation in Arlington. But in some communities, it was a desperate situation. There were no coffins. And in fact, as it began to spread throughout the country, uh, warnings were telegraphed ahead to distant places saying, get ready, it's coming, build coffins now. And in some cases, they had to put armed guards on coffins that were stacked out in front of undertakers because people would come in the night and steal them. Also, sometimes there were coffins on the sidewalk in front of undertakers with bodies already in them. And children playing on these coffins sometimes succumbed. But, um, so I don't, I don't know, I, I noticed one undertaker advertising in the advocate during that period. I don't know how much uh, business he was getting or whether he was able to cope with it or how many other uh, practitioners there were in town at the time. Yes? Um, how well prepared do I think we are if we had another such outbreak? Again, I'm not a medical person, but I think if there was something similar to this that broke out, it would break out a lot faster and spread much wider very rapidly. And uh, we could see uh, the hospitals and other facilities being completely, completely overwhelmed just as they were then. So. Yes. Was the medical care given at the time primarily palliative? Yes, they mostly gave them liquids to drink. They kept them comfortable and uh, waited until they died. Uh, some soldiers in the military camps were still alive when the nurses uh, orderlies proceeded to tie toe tags on them with the, their name, rank, and serial number because they were not expected to live. So. Any other questions? If not, oh yes? Uh, did I notice, were there any orphans? Um, in the case of Arlington, I did not notice any uh, two-parent uh, deaths. 
I was usually uh, a widow or a widower. In some cases, um, children were left motherless, but the father was overseas serving in the war and would not be home for at least a, a month or two. Um, I, I didn't mention, actually, that uh, at the same time this influenza was breaking out here, it had already crossed the lines in the trenches in France. And I think, I really feel, that it had a significant effect on the Germans' ability to prosecute the war. Once the influenza got back to the civilian population in Germany and in Berlin, and people started dropping like flies on the home front, Germany lost the will to continue with the war. And I think World War I was brought to an end not by victory at arms, but by a bug. Yes? Did the Germans think that the Allies had uh, somehow spread the disease on purpose? Just as we attributed the disease spread to German U-boats, the Germans also accused the Allies of sending over shells with influenza on them. Um, actually, it's thought there was, there was a place in the uh, uh, defenses that was a, a series of underground tunnels that had originally been a canal tunnel. And it ended up at one point, I think it was in October, but the Germans were defending one end of this and the uh, Americans were trying to fight their way into the other end of this canal tunnel and it was just a very narrow um, footpath through there so it was uh, a good defensive position. But it was also a damp, dark environment which easily spread the disease from the Allied soldiers on one end of this tunnel to the Germans on the other end and that's where it seems to have first really broken out heavily on the German side of the line. So. But yes, the, each side was accusing the other of germ warfare. Any other questions? Okay, seeing none, as I said, I invite you to come down and take a look at the, uh, the map and look at the lists, either alphabetical or chronological, to see if you, yes, we have one more question, yes. Those that survived the influenza, did they resume normal life? Um, pretty much eventually. I mean, they were not um, permanently impaired in any way, but sometimes they were as weak as a kitten for several days. So. All right, thank you very much.